Thanks so much for watching our show. We really appreciate the support. It costs a lot to produce, so we're asking for donations and pledges here on Patreon. Thanks again. Welcome to See It and Feel It with Dr. Brett, and I'm Dr. Brett, and today I'm here with Darren Shank, um, VP of Sales at Triage Now, which we'll get into at some point, and a former professional racquetball player, which is interesting in our world, Darren, because you know a lot of people aren't familiar with pro racquetball, and then you know we we know you got some messages about money and following your passion and all that kind of good stuff. But um, first, let's let's understand what professional racquetball is all about and you know how you got into it. I know it's been a while, but tell us about your background here. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. I, I do appreciate it. Um, so Definitely. my venture into the game is, is probably somewhat unique, but to answer your first question, I'll, I'll touch on the game itself. Um, pro racquetball has been a thing since the mid seventies, basically. Um, the sport kind of got started in the late sixties as a derivative of handball and tennis kind of getting combined together. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, it, it developed into a very, very popular sport in the late eighties and early nineties, or mm -hmm. sorry, late seventies, early eighties, every health club that was being built, put in 15 or 20 racquetball courts. Right. There was a guy who was a standout player at that time who really helped vault the sport to, to national notoriety. His name was Marty Hogan. And if you're old enough to remember battle of the superstars, the athlete versus athlete, um, show that was on TV where it was obstacle course and non-sport specific based skill challenges. Marty Hogan managed to get on that TV show and he ran circles around all of the other pro athletes, football players, baseball players, recognizable household names. Nobody knew who this guy was a racquetball player was until he went on that show and set the obstacle course record for the entire length of the show. For as long as it was on TV, nobody ever beat Marty Hogan's time. Well, hmm. that brought a lot of notoriety to the sport of racquetball. And he had a, a lifetime Nike sponsorship. He was sponsored by some outside of the industry companies. And that really brought racquetball to the forefront in that time frame. So it was a sport that everybody could play. Doesn't matter if you're young, old, uh, you know, if you have trouble getting around or if you're super fast everybody can play racquetball because it's in a contained space. It's the easiest racket sport to learn versus tennis or squash, other sports like that. And so for a while it was in its, in its heyday in the, I would say all of the eighties and early nineties. Wow. Then the, you know, the health club started changing the trends. You mm -hmm. know, you've got 800 square feet of air conditioned lighted space that two or maybe four people are using versus making a couple of the courts into an extension of the, of the weight room or a, an aerob step aerobics class or whatever it may be. And that kind of began the downward trend of the sport as a whole. The professional level has always been very consistent, tremendous athletes that are at the very, very top of the game. And it's called the International Racquetball Tour for a reason. We typically play events in Canada and Mexico, had some, some a really nice growth in uh, Latin American countries. And so on a world stage, racquetball is still growing, even though it's kind of tapering off here in the United States. Yeah, and so the challenge for you was what? That you know you wanted to make a, a full-time living at professional racquetball and it really wasn't, you know, that was hard to do. What was the challenge there? How long did you play? And tell um, us about that challenge. So I got started at eight, the age of 15. I went to my first tournament after only playing for a couple of months, I played in the lowest amateur division possible in a pro event, which also has amateur events accompanying it. I got my butt kicked day one, hour one of the tournament. <laughs> and I sat around on the bleachers pouting, watching all the pros play. And, you know, in all transparency, I was just enamored with the idea of traveling around the country, wearing these cool warm up suits, all the guys had, you know, hot <laughs> women with them. And, and I thought, man, what a way to make a living. This would be phenomenal. So at that moment, despite being so new at it, 
and having lost, you know, <laughs> earlier in the tournament than almost anyone else, I decided this is what I'm going to do. So pretty, pretty awesome. I, but real quick, I had no idea sure. that that hot women followed pro racquetball players like that. Well, as a sidebar, this will this will kind of shed some light on it. And I've, I have not told this story on any other podcast I've ever done. Uh, to protect the name of the innocent or not so innocent, I'll, I'll just use first names. There was a guy named Dan who was on the pro tour at that time, who was a very good looking guy. He would show up in Phoenix every year, two days before the tournament started. And there was a best legs for men contest at a local bar. And he would go and enter that and win the thousand dollar prize money and meet at least one woman at that event every year. So year after year, he did this at the tournament in Phoenix. So he shows up at the tournament. He happens to be from my hometown back in Pennsylvania. He's got two girls with him and wearing this, you know, literally a tank top that is like, you know, uh, it, it's a trimmed down version of a tank top to play his matches in. Long blonde hair, tan skin, you know, just like movie star good looks. And he's got two girls who are, happen to be roommates who have escorted him into the club and are sitting there watching him play racquetball. I mean, I, as, as a 15 year old kid, I was hooked, right? I mean, that's <laughs> to me, I'm like, man, sign me up. Where, how can I get started right away? Yeah, he was your equivalent <laughs> of a California surfer, dude. Pretty gotcha. much, yeah. yeah that was I definitely gotcha. his look, for sure. Yeah. And so, how did you turn this sport into professional and how long did you last? Well, for me, I had the opportunity to learn from some guys that played on the pro tour at that time who lived here in Phoenix. So I did all the work that I could. I didn't really have a coach that I could work with. Um, my family's not super wealthy where we owned a health club like some of my peers that I competed against later on. Uh, that, that was their background story. Um, I, I kind of did things the hard way as best I could. Lots of guys were willing, to, lots of men and women who were good players were willing to help. So I just sort of picked a little bit up from everybody that I could and, and blended that into my own style and just did as much work as possible, played every tournament that I could and learned how to play at a higher and higher level all the time. So I turned pro in 1994. I went to a tournament in Vegas and went through a couple of rounds of the pro qualifying. I didn't make it into the main draw. But that first tournament, I had a pretty good showing. And I was, in my mind, that kind of made me feel like, okay, I'm not at the top level yet, but I belong at, at, in this level of the game. And I, and I still have some work to do to get where I want. But it kind of solidified that all the work I had done to that point got me where I should be. Mm. Very cool. Very cool. And so how long were you on the tour for? What was the tour like? So I played professionally for six years. Um, I, I, it was a grind. I mean, I did not make any money at it. I <laughs> eventually got into the top 20 in the world. Uh, number 18 was my career high ranking. And wow. I held that for about three, three years of the six years that I was on the pro tour, um, traveled to about 23 to 26 events every year. Wow. So I was on the road every other weekend as an average, sometimes mm. for blocks of two and three weeks at a time, and then would come back train, play, try to, you know, make some money in, in between tournaments to, to get to the next tournament. So eventually that really, you know, wore on me. Yeah. The top couple of guys made all the money. Anybody that was outside of the top eight definitely had a part-time job. And, mm. you know, that just made it a lot tougher. Yeah. You know, I think that that's, that's a sort of common path in other sports as well, though. Like, you know, cause I've worked with a lot of professional golfers, you know, on all these mini tours and so mm -hmm. on. And even, you know, what used to be web.com that, you know, wow. and that, and that, right. So, right. So corn Ferry tour now, yeah. or the Symmetra tour of the LPGA tour, um, usually they need sponsor money, right. It's very hard for them to, to make it. It's hard to make it very difficult to make it, but then you need, you know, 50 to hundred K roughly to sort of compete, right? Because yeah. if you're caddying too much or whatever your, you know, part-time job is, if you're doing that too much, you have almost no chance, right? Because the me. other guys, yeah. So that is, that is a super challenge, but also being on the road. I mean, when you're young, it's fun, but it's also yeah. tiring as well, right? So it sounds like yeah. it was a good experience. Is there any regret there? Yes, but not many. 
Mm. The biggest regret that I have is that I didn't enjoy the, the process and that journey as much as I should have. Uh, in retrospect, looking back at it, it's easy to some, kind of see those errors and think, ah, man, I wish I would have done that differently. Meaning that, that it was hard for you to just, you know, enjoy the, the, the moments along the way. Were you so competitive or were you frustrated? What was the what was getting in the way? You, you brought up an excellent point, which was my, the, the cornerstone of my struggle. Because I didn't make a, a, a lot of money, really not much of any money, I was constantly teaching lessons, stringing rackets. I actually was working at the tournaments themselves, where oh. I was writing articles for the magazine that was around at that time, taking photographs, um, stringing rackets, doing clinics and lessons and things like that, just to be able to... <laughs> In, in a few cases, put mo gas money uh, or have gas money to put gas in the car to get back home. I mean, literally, it was it was that tight sometimes. So you, you kind of hinted to this in, in the intro. What I learned from that was I should have done something else to facilitate being a pro racquetball player. Instead yeah. of making that passion my job and trying to scrounge a living out of it, I should have done something else that allowed me to make enough money but had the flexibility to still go and play on the pro tour. I yeah. think that would have really added to my to my experience. Yeah, and that's you know tricky because I imagine you were in your early 20s, right? I mean, we're talking early to mid 20s and yeah. you know one of the things I've found that without mentoring and guidance it's very hard for kids to figure that out at a young age, right? If you had a, I'm sure you probably have a fair amount of passion for mentoring and guiding, right? Like, you. right, exactly. Because yeah. it's something that if, had you had the right people behind you, might they might have helped you figure that out at a younger age, right? Yeah. And then you get more out of the experience. Yep. I had a lot of help along the way, but no one ever planted the seed of, you should be a fireman who plays pro racquetball. Right. I didn't come to that conclusion until about four years ago. <laughs> and then you became a fireman? No, I'm just kidding. No, but I no, should I know have. you went into sales. <laughs> yeah, I, if, if I'd have been a fireman, I would have had a, a job that I Four. worked 10 days a month. Yeah. I can work out on the clock. I can right. trade shifts anytime when I'm traveling or whatever. And even the added bonus of the fire people who are, are firefighters, it's such a brotherhood that if I was going to Boston or going to LA for tournaments, I probably could have called some people up and said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm with fire station 245 here in Phoenix. I need a place to crash. Can I come stay with you guys? It even yeah. would have made things easier that way too. I didn't know that until now. And yeah. I, I would never let somebody of my, one of my own students follow in my exact same path because I did things the hard way and it led to me burning out and eventually just walking away from the game. Um, and not, in some ways, never really looking back. Yeah, but, you know, sometimes, though, I found, you know, look, I've done, you know, decades of psychology and coaching, right? And I've helped thousands and thousands of people, right? And, you know, sometimes we, you know, we learn more from from the struggle, right? Oh, so you my I would imagine you're in some ways, though, you're a better human being for that struggle. Without a doubt. Yeah, yeah I, I so, don't in retrospect, I don't regret it because yeah. I, you're exactly right. We're, we're all the sum total of our experiences as of today. Yeah. But, and, I, and I really don't know if I would have gotten any farther up the food chain, so to speak. You mean 18 to 15? I, I, I would imagine you would have got to number nine. Maybe. <laughs> I'm I mean, just being playful, there I don't was know, a, but somewhere. There was definitely a gap between yeah. the guys inside the 16, from 16 to eight, there was a definite structure. And then eight on to number one, I mean, you could go through the draw at each tournament and say, he's going to win this match. He'll end up in the semis. I mean, it was pretty cut and dry the years that I played. So I don't know if I ever would have gotten ranked yeah. any higher, but I certainly do believe very, very strongly that I would have enjoyed the process a lot more. And who knows, I, I may still be competing today at, at the amateur level had I not had the burnout experience that I did. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense what you're sharing. And I think that that burnout experience, uh, Darren, is pretty common, you know, because I, I just, you know, I've been working with a pro soccer player and he's just decided to take an indefinite sabbatical because he's been playing soccer since he was six yeah. and, fer and ferociously and, you know, with an immense amount of competition and at the higher levels, uh, 
the competition as you experience, it just gets more and more intense. And not everybody is wired like Nadal or Federer or Djokovic, right? I mean, or Tom Brady. I mean, like, you know, some of these guys, the way they're wired, it's so ferocious, right? It's so intense that it is actually, you know, a wonderful fit for them. But if you're not wired that way, it might not be a fit. Other people aren't quite wired with that kind of intensity or focus. And it's hard to sort of, you know, you can train people in sports psychology and you can have a real impact. But if the if the insane passion isn't really there to be, yeah. you know, it's almost an obsessive passion, right? Yeah. To be number one, so to speak, right? Yeah. Or inside the top five. It's like most of those guys that get to number one in anything, you know, whether it's Tony Robbins and freaking, you know, personal growth or whatever sales, right. right? It's like they're 24 seven, you know, 18 hours a day, like yeah. seven days a week. And, you know, they usually have significant balance issues. Yeah. So somebody that's wired a little more balanced isn't really a fit for that. Yeah. And, and I, I would, I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I think that I sort of started out that way. And then as I peaked, I didn't necessarily set out to be number one because I, I started about 10 years later than most of my peer competitors did. And I was still able to make it to that level. I don't know that I could have done that in any other sport. Racquetball being a smaller sport, totally. afforded me the luxury of starting. If you're, if you're not somebody at age 15 in, in the world of tennis, you've missed your window, right? I didn't no, pick so the racquetball racket till, till 15. So I was fortunate in that aspect. Um, but, you know, the couple of guys that were on top, you know, that, that traded off as the number one players when, in my time, and now the guy who's been number one for the last decade or more in the sport uh, have been some of the most dominant athletes in all of sports. You'll, you'll appreciate the level of this. The current number one guy, he's originally from Canada. His name's Kane Wazelenchuk. He lives in Dallas, Texas now. He went through an entire season – without dropping a game to a competitor. Not one single game did he lose that entire season. And he's playing against the other best players in the world all the time. <laughs> totally. That is, That's I mean, insane. As much as I love you Federer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah he loses occasionally. You know, it reminds me of when I was a kid, I was a Yankee fan, right? Because I grew up in Connecticut. And Ron Guidry had a year where I think he was like 27 and two. Yeah. And he was like, like, practically unheadable. He yeah. was so dominant that it was just, it was absurd. I mean, you know, mat batters would just get mowed down one after the next. I mean, when, so some of these top athletes, they go through, you know, phases where they're almost unstoppable. It sounds like this guy, though, has stayed there for a while, which is unusual. It is impressive how dominant he has been, and especially given the fact that he's now, I think he's 38 and, wow. uh, you know, he's competing against guys that are now, excellent they, players who yeah. are 21, 23 years old and wow. still run in circles around them. Yeah. Now, does, do they get drug tested? I'm a little suspicious here. He's 38. <laughs> like, you know, um, I don't want to offend this guy personally, but no, I'm starting no. to get a little bit of radar going. You know, yeah. what is he, what's he injecting here? Like, you know, how, you know, what is the sport? How regulated is it for performance enhancing drugs? Well, Heads. he... He's just that good. And to answer your question, because he was Canadian and competed on the Canadian national team, um, there is pretty extensive drug testing that goes to the Pan Am Games where he represented Canada and, and some other events. So, uh, yeah, and, you know, I am I hear what you're saying. It, it, that kind of stuff is pretty prevalent in, in, in sports in general. Um, but in racquetball, being bigger doesn't make you better. Maybe right. if you had the ability to train harder and recover faster. That would have some impact, but right. um, I, I don't my have underst any my understanding with the ped with, with with you know some of the steroids and performance enhancing drugs. It's not really just about that they're bigger, stronger, faster. They have the psychological confidence that comes with it. So it's like they you know they have this insane confidence because yeah. they're you know, a little bit, you know, enhanced, so to speak. I'm not saying, look, I'm not saying he's doing that. I'm just, I, you know, it's like he's beating 22 year olds. He's 38 at a sport that probably crushes your knees after a while. Right. What, where do you get hurt in racquetball? Um, 
knock on wood for me. Thanks for watching See It and Feel It with Dr. Brett and stay tuned for part two of this interview. Remember to like, subscribe, and share with a friend.